So this, I'm just going to give you some examples of MAG2DC and then we'll do it ourselves. So what can you test in MAG2DC? Acquisition height. So these really, I'm just going to flip through them. So when you're holding a magnetometer, the sensor is at about one meter. When you're up in the aeroplane, that really bad, well not bad, the, the regional data they were flying, I think at 150 meters. The newer aeroplanes, I think, fly lower, like 80 meters, and they now have gyrocopters, which I don't know if you've seen pictures, it's guys in like small helicopter type things that they fly in that, they can fly much lower, and the drones um, that are, there's no people on board with them, they can fly at like, I want to say 20 meters height, I think it depends whether they're over houses or not. So different resolution, but also like the drones are quite wobbly, so you've got different trade-offs. So you can see here, profile bearing, I'll talk about just now, so what direction is your profile? Dip angle is 90 degrees, so here is a duck um, that is vertical, body depth, body depth, so the top of the duck over here starts at 5 meters, and ducks, how deep does a duck go? Very deep. I don't think people know. In general, they're very, very deep. Um, body width, 5 meters, so it's quite a thin duck. Susceptibility, even though I say susceptibility, it's susceptibility contrast. So what is the difference between the background here, susceptibility, and the dark susceptibility? The background is very close to zero, so technically your answer in the end is close to whatever the value is for your, your dark. So we're putting 0.01 SI units here. Reference height, okay, they've got two meters, so let's assume your magnetometer is a bit higher. Maximum depth displayed, uh, 2,000 meters. These are all parameters you're going to have to put in. Intensity, 28,000 nanoteslas, I'll tell you about this now, inclination and declination. This is the magnetic field at the time that the survey was carried out. And so um, that obviously has an effect of, on the induced field. So your magnetic anomaly results from the Earth's magnetic field inducing um, a field in your body. So you need to know what it was at the time you took the measurement because that's going to ultimately affect your reading. So this value is for South Africa. Um, they kind of already in their um, default values. It changes from year to year, so you should try and get it a bit more accurate, but for now we're just going to use these general values. If you use the software for data from Namibia or more equatorial regions, those values would have to change or else you're going to struggle to fit your data. So those um, are very important values to keep track of. So here we have two meters that our magnetometer is above the ground. Here we have 15 meters, so you can see the anomaly is getting wider. So nothing's changed. The dark is still the dark, it's just at what height are you measuring? So that's 15, that's 30, 50, 80, 100, 120, 150. So you can see this is the data you're getting in an aeroplane, this is the data you're getting on the ground. So it's just that you're getting a lot more information down here. Um, it's a lot thinner. When you model, you put in a value in there. So it knows whether to expect a broad anomaly or a thin anomaly. But you just lose more information as you go up. Next thing, dip angle. We're not going to play around with it so much today, but the dip of your dike will affect your data. So you can see this is a steeply, is there a dip value is 10 degrees, 20, and you can see the main thing that's changing here is the side, um, side of your anomaly. So 10, 20, 30, 45, it's quite symmetrical, 50, and then as you're getting vertical, you're getting this negative value here. So maybe if you're in the field and you're, the anomaly you measure is all positive, it could be that your dark is different at 45 degrees. So there's no negative component. It could be due to something else as well. It could be due to remnant magnetization, but I think I'm not going to go into detail unless we have time at the end about that. Okay, so that's your dip angle. Different station spacing. We've kind of spoken about this already. Uh, here the station spacing is listed on the end. It's at currently, did I change it, one meter. 
So again, nothing's changed about the dike. It's just how often are you measuring? And like we said, we're going to start losing information. So that's one meter, five meters, 10, 20. So you can see this negative is becoming quite predominant. 50, you can see the, the resolution. You're actually starting to see individual dots. It's no longer a smooth curve. 100 is quite terrible. Okay, so those that's your effect of station spacing. You want to measure quite often, but you also don't want to take forever doing your measurement. Number of bodies, which is another thing we can test today, is if you've got two dikes, how close together must they be before you can't notice that they're two dikes? When they're too close together, their signals merge. And so you think, oh, I've got one very thick duct, but actually you've got two thinner ducts. So here you can see bottom right here, it says body separation is 60 meters. So it's actually looking at the height of measurement. So bottom left here is reference height. So if I'm doing a ground survey, I can see that there are two ducts that are 60 meters apart. If I then go and do, maybe there's a drone flying over at 15 meters, I can still see that they're two, but they're starting to merge. So again, if you're flying higher and higher, your signals start to merge together. And then here at 30 meters, which is still drone height or gyrocopter height, you can just see that there's a bit, but if you've got noise in this data, that's going to be tough. And then at 50 meters, which you're going to be helicopter or above, you can't see that there's two dikes there at all. So just to make you aware of the different types of measuring um, in geophysics and the pros and cons. And that's what you're going to do with your modeling. So if, some, if your client comes to you and says, we can pay for an aeromag survey, we can pay for a ground survey, you can say to him, look, we're going to be able to see two dikes on the ground at 60 meters apart. We're not going to see them if we're flying at 80 meters. So you're going to put that in your, your report to the client. Is that a question? So this is the effect of different station spacing on seeing two dikes. And so you can see, assuming we've got a station spacing of 5 or 10 meters, as these dikes come closer and closer together, um, I start to lose them. And that's still, they're still apart there. If I zoomed in, they are still apart. Um, so the main thing is just when they're that distance apart, I can't tell that there are two of them. It looks like one big dike. And so the thing is, in platinum mining, you'll be amazed at what they'll mine. Like even if there's a few centimeters between the two, and sometimes when the platinum price is better, it's actually economical to mine there. So they don't want to lose that. And so if you were doing a, a survey and you did smaller station spacing, you might be able to pick up that there's two dikes. There's no examples of this, but it's completely what you said of we can vary station spacing and our height, but you can also vary the width of the body, the depth of the body. That's why I said to you, there are several different models you can produce. And unless you've got borehole data or seismic data, um, sometimes resistivity, sometimes gravity, it's very difficult to say this model is absolutely right. Something very important to note before we start doing modeling is that in the software, you have to put in your line orientation. So what direction were you walking when you were collecting the magnetic data? Were you walking north, south, east, west, or west, east, or south, north, or maybe at a different angle? You might think that this isn't important and you can just put in any value, but it actually changes your anomaly shape quite significantly. Magnetics is affected by orientation, um, your position on the earth. And so you can see in the figure here, I've got four different orientation values, but with exactly the same dike model. And so you can see that the anomaly itself changes according to the orientation. So it is very important that you put in the correct value and that you pay attention um, to this. Something else that's also very important in MAGTDC is that when you put a body in, it must be put in in a clockwise direction. So that means when you click the points to add the body, you must go clockwise. And you can see here in this image what your anomaly will look like. Um, if you're going from south to north, north, the negative will be towards the south and the positive will be towards the north. That is always the case for a southern hemisphere profile. So the positive will always be towards the equator, so towards the north. 
if you put the point of the body in an anti-clockwise direction, you can see that your anomaly is flipped around. And so you get an incorrect anomaly. You'll struggle to uh, model your data because your data will be in the opposite direction. And so very important to remember, always put your point in, in a clockwise direction.